Good and warm afternoon to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management's Autumn Client Webinar. Uh, my name is Richard Champion. I'm Co-Chief Investment Officer at Canaccord. Uh, and today, to help me discuss uh, markets, their interesting, challenging, exciting, and even dangerous nature, is my friend and good colleague, uh, Thomas Beckett. Uh, Tom joined us when we joined forces with PSW uh, 16 months, 16 days, and just over 12 hours ago, um, every minute of which he has uh, enlivened our, our, our communal experience. So the format today is we're going to spend uh, about 20 odd minutes, Tom and I, uh, discussing uh, some questions in a sort of guided forum uh, covering some of the main points today. And then we're going to answer, hopefully, lots of excellent questions from yourselves uh, so that we can get a really good view uh, of where we see opportunities, where we think markets stand after a tumultuous two years, uh, and where we can go forward from here. So without further ado, perhaps I could start, Tom. You and I have been going around the country recently, and the question which seems to come up perhaps most often at the moment uh, is, should I switch my assets to cash? Uh, something which no good wealth manager really likes to hear, but it's a very good question. Um, given that interest rates have risen, um, and we live in this world of uncertainty, uh, how would you answer that, Tom? Well, thank you, Richard. And again, thanks to everyone for joining and thank you for all your support through what Richard referred to as tumultuous times in financial markets over the last couple of years. Uh, before we start, though, a very important point. Richard gave me a very nice introduction and I must point out that you shouldn't be worried that the co-CIOs of the firm that looks after your money have to sit in separate rooms. Uh, we've been assured by marketing that that's the best way to get high quality acoustics. And uh, it's nothing to do with the fact that Richard and I can't stand each other, uh, which is obviously not true. Uh, but anyway, the right question to ask, should we be switching our wealth management portfolios into cash? And it's a fair and understandable question. And how strange the change between the environment of the last decade and this decade, where in the last decade, as we know, interest rates, government bond yields, money market funds, the rate of return was basically zero before fees and before for uh, inflation. This decade something at the moment which is very different and cash has become a viable alternative once again. So it's the right question to ask and we would be naive and irresponsible and not upholding our fiduciary duties if we didn't point out that cash actually is a much more relevant part of your asset allocation as we sit here today with some attractive rates of return on offer. But I think we would argue, and I'm sure you agree Richard, that wealth management is complemented by um, attractive rates of levels of income on cash. Cash is not necessarily a replacement for, but it's, uh, it's opposed actually a complement for the wealth management portfolios that we offer. But we have to point out that at this point in time, the rates of return on cash become higher and we have to work harder to achieve our clients' um, support. But I think there are a number of reasons why, despite the fact that we've had a volatile and frankly, pretty miserable couple of years of financial markets and a lot of volatility, there are lots of reasons why we need to reaffirm why people shouldn't give up on wealth management and why it might be currently down, but is not out for the long term. The first thing to note, as we're going to talk about in today's discussion, I'm sure the questions will enliven um, the discussions we're going to have uh, about the fact that we can currently find a great deal of investment opportunities that make us attractive, attracted to them. There are lots of things out there which through 2022 and the volatility within this year have gone to levels and attractive valuations that we think are very compensatory for the risks we're taking. So finding good opportunities for your cash is, is, is not a problem for us at this point in time, even if it might be taking some time to realise the potential. Undoubtedly, cash as we sit here today, and if you could go to a bank and find the level of interest rates, good luck with that. But if you could do then we must sit here and say that cash levels are much more attractive. We do have some suspicions, though, over how long interest rates can remain at these levels. Now, I'm drawing a crude diagram, but that crude gut diagram refers to what the Bank of England have talked about, the table mountain profile. And for those simple people like me, what they're saying is effectively that interest rates will reach a level and then plateau for a long time at restrictive levels into the future and then come down gradually. If that is the case, and the Bank of England is finally right about something, it could well be that cash rates remain higher for longer. 
But we have some suspicions around that. And we think that actually it might be a bit more like a Matterhorn profile, which they've discounted, where interest rates have gone up quite a long way and then might come down more quickly. But in very simple terms, we just don't expect these levels of interest rates to be in play for a very long time to the future. Of course, when you think about the range of opportunities you have and fixed term deposits are the sorts of things which are cited as better investment opportunities, and they are in the short run, we must also point out that there is both inflation risk around that and also reinvestment risk. How might financial markets and indeed interest rates look when you come to refinance those fixed term deposits in the future? And one final point, I mean, we can talk about the service levels that you should be getting for your investment managers. They're obviously key as a tax efficiency. But I think when it comes to your and my natural domain, Richard, the concept of investment and in particular, the concept of diversification, the move higher we've seen in interest rates, and the poor performance we've seen in fixed interest markets in the last few years has meant that the whole concept of a balanced portfolio and equities and fixed interest providing offsetting factors against each other is once again relevant once again. And that's how much has changed in the last couple of years. So right now, cash looks attractive, but we think it is a complement to rather than a replacement for wealth management. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, I mean, the point about the return of the balanced portfolio is a very good one particularly when we live through uh, a, a time of such uh, s- severe and it would appear rising risks from a geopolitical point of view. We've all seen over the last week or more the absolutely revolting uh, events that have occurred in Israel. And of course, that's on top of the Ukraine-Russia war uh, and worries about Taiwan. Do you think that relatively more optimistic view Uh, is challenged in uh, in, uh, optimistic view in terms of future returns from other asset classes is challenged by this increase uh, in geopolitical risk? Or do you think um, uh, uh, this, and and do you think this is a short term or a medium and longer term uh, uh, concern? Yeah, and as hard as it is, as you rightly point out, the events were tragic and and revolting. And we, uh, but as investors, we, have to sometimes leave those thoughts to one side and and think about the reality for making portfolio returns, as difficult as it is uh, when such events are taking place around the world. And and in very simple terms, sadly, this is no different um, to the outlook and the story that we've been talking about uh, throughout the last five years. We live in a turbulent time, an era I've described since 2019 has been the turbulent 20s, and, and nothing that we're seeing now is obviously a counter argument to the fact that we're going through a turbulent period. And they really strengthen the views that we've held that this decade was going to be very uncertain. It was going to be very volatile. But I think to your point, does that mean that it's not a good hunting ground for investment returns? Now, in very simple terms, everyone on this call will say that for the last few years, returns have been very disappointing for investment markets around the world. That is blindingly obvious. The question is, as we sit here today, Do those tragic events and other factors around the world deflect away from what investors can make in the future? I think the very simple argument that we would always have is the only future guide to investment success is buying attractive investments at sensible valuations and holding them for a long period of time. And that motto will still be what we keep to through this turbulent decade. And I think that stands us in good stead at the moment, because what we've seen in the last few years in no small part part as a reflection of what we've been seeing at a sort of macroeconomic and geopolitical level, is that asset valuations have come down considerably. And we're a very long way away from where we were at the end of 2021, when all these risks existed, but they were not being priced into markets. Now we would argue they're being much better reflected. And the way I would sit here today and say that in very simple terms, there's a difficult equation for our clients to balance, but one which is very much more in our favour. You can turn on the news in the morning, not something I'd recommend, or pick up a newspaper, again, likewise. And you don't need myself and Richard to sit here and tell you the world's a difficult place. You know, we we know that. But at the same time, markets know that. And that has been factored into valuations. So what we're seeing now is that valuations much better reflect the risks that are out there. And we would suggest that they're in balance. So that equation is very difficult. But that complacency is gone and valuations are much more compensatory for the risks you're taking. As hard as it is at times like this to refer back to simple things like that, we have to do that as investors. And I, and I believe the outlook, and we share this view, is actually much better than people are currently forecasting. Thanks, Tom. You've spoken uh, quite a bit over the uh, over the last couple of years and, and a little bit more about l- us living in a sort of twilight zone, uh, a grey area where 
uncertainty is all around us, where it's very difficult to plot a path because uh, there's so much fog, financial fog out there that gets in our way. Do you sense some of that fog is lifting and things are a little bit clearer uh, as we go from here? Uh, sadly, in the twilight zone we're operating, as you referred to, it's, it's not just a financial fog, it's a fog around everything. Referring back to the previous question, there is a geopolitical fog. I'm sure we'll get lots of questions on politics afterwards. There's a political fog in the UK, the US and other places around the world. There's an economic fog, there's a fog over inflation, and there's a fog over what might happen with regards to interest rates. And we can go on to talk about fogs over corporate profits in a minute. And there's fog everywhere in very simple terms. But again... You know, the fog is um, uh, d deflects away from the fundamental focus on how our assets priced and what might future returns be. Are we any closer to ask, answering those questions that we've been talking to you about all this year and are likely to talk about to you next year? No, possibly not. But again, the fact that asset valuations are more attractive, we'll get into the weeds on that in a minute, certainly set us up for better returns in the future, we think. But let's try and answer a few of those questions to give people a guide as to what we think. And, and the good news is we'll do one of these again in a few months' time. So when I'm wrong, you can come back and, and criticise me directly. But in very simple terms, next year, we think that a global recession will be avoided. They're typically quite rare anyway, but we think a slowing US economy will be met with a improvement in the Chinese economy. And we end up with a high score, score draw. Uh, and we end up with an economic situation, which is not spectacular, um, but, but, it's, but it's solid enough to make asset market progress. At the same time, we think inflationary pressures are going to continue to recede. And I think the views we've held over that over the last 18 months since we conjoined forces have, have been right. Inflation was high and uncomfortable, but it's still coming down. Even if it's lagging in the UK, it is coming down. Uh, and if that is the case, and a slow but positive economic environment combined with slower but positive inflation, that should allow the central bankers to start stop talking about putting interest rates up further and potentially pivot in the middle of next year, i.e. we might start to see the tone around interest rate cuts as opposed to interest rate hikes at this point in time. Combining all those things together still makes for a foggy outlook, we will admit, uh, but one that we think where some of the problems that we're talking about today might start to be alleviated next year. Uh, so we're not talking about rampant optimism. We're talking about sensible realism and the fact that actually next year might not be as bad as some people are currently forecasting. Thanks. I mean, let's look at what we've discussed. We've talked about cash. We've talked about geopolitics. Uh, we've talked about some interest rate movements that we expect and in the prospects for inflation. How does that all join together in terms of what we're thinking about today for our clients uh, asset allocation? Well, it's a perfectly fair question. And, and I think sometimes it's, it's really important that if you haven't got all the answers, and, and I'm sure that everyone on, on today's call um, does exactly the same thing in, in their daily lives and in, in, in their working and their working lives, if you haven't got all the answers, trying to guess is, is the wrong thing. So what, the way that we would look at it right now is think that on every single major input into our asset allocation framework, there is uncertainty. But at the same time there's uncertainty, there's better valuations. And I hope that all can sympathise with the view that we have that in such an instance, making extreme bets with our clients' portfolios or extreme positional stances is probably the better way of putting it, is the wrong thing to do. So we're currently really quite neutral vis-a-vis -vis the long-term strategic asset allocations that our clients have signed up to. In fact, actually, we're becoming more neutral to reflect the fact that we think that the balance of risks and rewards is actually in quite a sensible balance at this point in time. So when it comes to overall portfolio levels, I think that we are neutral with regards to overall risk. And when it comes to asset classes, we're pretty neutral with regards to the strategic asset allocations that our clients have signed up to. Beneath the bonnet of those potentially cowardly stances, um, and there are times to be coward, there's also times to be very brave. I would suggest that right now being neutral is appropriate. We are taking quite big positional stances in fixed income, as I'll perhaps talk about later, and in equities, as you're going to go on to talk about in a minute. So we're not we're not scared or, or worried about making big calls. It's just at a headline level being neutral 
at the moment feels exactly the right place to be. And I, I think the three watch words that you're probably getting really bored of listening to every time we write to you or speak to you are diversified, balanced and open-minded. That has got to be a sensible approach for next year, not least at the time where we think that equity markets and fixed interest markets and alternative markets are broadly all around that, that right price, as we'll go on to talk about. So that, that in mind, let, let's get into some of the, the, the more interesting details. Well, hopefully some of what I said was interesting, but the more interesting details around asset classes. Because if you look at client valuations or you look at headline indices, they might tell a very different tale to what's actually been happening in financial markets this, this year, Richard. And one of the interesting dynamics in particular has been the dominance or the omnipotence of the US market, and in particular, a few small uh, a small number of large companies. So what's been happening there and what are the messages for our clients? Yeah, Tom, you're quite right. And I've uh, redone the numbers this morning uh, to get them bang up to date because this is a, a two or three days out of date, this chart. So the S&P 500, the, which is the um, the orange line in this chart, the one at the top, um, is currently at the close last night up 14.2% year to date, which is a great return. Um, the problem is, as you highlighted, uh, actually that that return has been driven by really a narrow band of stocks. You, will, you may well have seen in the press about the so-called Magnificent Seven, the seven technology titans. Uh, and uh, if you add the healthcare company Eli Lilly, which has uh, discovered an anti-obesity drug, uh, which also much in the press right now, uh, on average, year to date, those eight companies are up 91%. Uh, which is an astonishing return. Obviously, they had difficult periods uh, in 2022, and they're recovering a bit from there, a bit. They're recovering a lot from there. But 91% from those eight. <coughs> and those eight today uh, equate to 28% of the US market, which is an enormous weighting for such strong performance. You know, they range from Eli Lilly, as I said, which is a market capitalization of around 500 billion, to Apple, which has a market capitalization of around $3 trillion. So these are massive companies. Uh, if you weight their size by their return, they more than account for that 14.2%. In fact, it comes to nearer 20% than 14%. So you can, get, you can get that the rest of the market in aggregate, obviously there's good bits and there are bad bits in the US, has done very similarly to what everywhere else in the world has done. So you see here the UK in yellow done about 5% and emerging markets done a little bit worse. Um, uh, you know, none of these uh, markets have really made much progress after a really difficult year last year. So it is a very much a case of those tech titans plus a couple of healthcare names driving things forward, which means from a client's perspective, if you're not fully weighted to all those enormous companies, you're going to struggle to beat that benchmark, that that that, that market index. Uh, and this is the challenge which investors around the entire world are facing. It's made particularly acute because those seven, dare I say, eight companies uh, are now not what you might call bargain basement and cheap. Uh, in many cases, you would indeed call them rather expensive. So what this market movement has done this movement of 90% in this year to date, it has brought forward the returns from the, the these companies, all of which are absolutely excellent companies, superbly well managed, throwing off huge amounts of cash. They just happen to be rather expensive. So if you were to say the reward for owning an excellent company might be 20% a year uh, in long-term returns, what I think you've done is you've brought forward a lot of those returns. So today, it might be 5% rather than 20, or maybe 8% rather than 20. So that means, given their high valuations, you're taking quite a lot on trust to, 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 to be heavily weighted at this stage. And as I say, it's a challenge which our colleagues across the entire investment industry have been facing up to all this year. Yeah, but uh, um, we need to remember three trillion dollars for Apple's market, Apple's market capitalization. Even when we become a need to tie to the seven billion dollars in those financial crisis years, is a very large problem. And particularly, the returns those companies have generated this year have flattered indices and, and actually meant that huge parts of the market have been have been left behind. 
And I think that's one of the really important points we wanted to draw out today. People might look at portfolio valuations, having heard about the sorts of returns of those very big companies, and, and, and be notably a bit disappointed because you might have expected to have made more money this year. But a lot of that goes down to the fact that big parts of the market have been left behind. And perhaps the best news amongst that is some of the things we really like for the long term are currently much cheaper than they've been for quite a long time, and sentiment's pretty negative. That makes us excited, doesn't it? I agree entirely. I mean, as you said earlier on, the, the key to strong investment performance is to buy good stuff at reasonable prices. And the really nice news uh, that we have today is there's a lot of good stuff, which is at very reasonable prices. So we've mentioned a few of the infrastructure, uh, which we all know has been spent uh, being been invested in very, very significantly by governments for two main reasons. One, to try and shift our economies into a more greener place. And the second is to try and make our supply chains more secure. So best example of that would be the um, CHIPS Act in the US, where subsidies have been provided for chip makers to build semiconductor plants in Arizona rather than in Taiwan or elsewhere. Um, so there's an enormous amount of infrastructure spending going on, you know, massive amounts in the, in the US in particular. But these companies are just not seeing the benefit in their share price today. And that means for us, value is being built up within them, which we can access now and build on in portfolios, even if it's a challenging environment right now in terms of their share price. Healthcare is another one. Uh, even though I mentioned a uh, healthcare titan, which has done so well, other healthcare companies haven't done nearly so well. There's been a real fad about these um, obesity drugs at the moment. Other healthcare companies have languished more or less and gone sideways. Uh, and you know what? We're all still getting older. We're all still, um, even with low growth, we're still earning more and being able to uh, in, uh, enjoy more healthcare at a later age. You know, medical interventions like hip replacements, et cetera, at a later age. And this is all good for the healthcare industry, which we think has got very, very secure long-term dynamics with decent valuations. Um, and there are other areas. There are so-called consumer staples. These are things which people will go out and buy at all times because they have to. Food, uh, food manufacturers, dare I say, not, not everyone's a cup of tea by any uh, means, tobacco, alcoholic beverages, beverages more generally. These are the kind of things which people have to buy. And they've languished very, very significantly this year. After a very little blip up at the beginning of the year, they've sold off. In part, because quite often all these sectors are lumped together and are called bond proxies. And of course, bonds have not been as good as people had hoped. Some parts of them, as we'll see in a minute, have actually done rather well. But some headline areas, particularly uh, in, in the UK, uh, as Tom will discuss in a minute, have been far less uh, opportune. So th there are these opportunities, which I think is great. I don't want to get, again, as you said earlier, I don't want to get over excited because these are good long-term investments, which may take a little while really to start compounding up in portfolios, but there are plenty of them out there. So good long-term investments, takes a while to get going. Uh, one of the questions we had sent in lots beforehand, and I can see a couple of them um, already come in, is around your favourite subject of the UK equity market. And I think I can sum up all the questions by just saying, is there any hope? Well, the UK, the most unpopular international market, and partly as a result, becoming more and more uh, irrelevant to international investors. For those of you that are unaware, the UK uh, stock market comprises now just under 4% of the world's stock market. It is about the same size as Apple on its own. So for many investors outside the UK, whether or not to invest here is entirely voluntary. And you know, like it or not, whether it's right or not, they have tended to look at the UK more recently in the last five, six, seven, eight years, uh, pretty much since the Scottish referendum, as a place they don't really want to get involved in. There are too many risks. There were the risks over Brexit, now hopefully resolved. They're the risks which Liz Truss's experiment seemed to uh, encapsulate. And so people out, outside the UK said, not interested, I don't need it. I can just, in, I can just invest in Apple and it's got the same impact on my portfolio. Uh, at the same time, for the last 20 years and more, 25 years, UK domestic investors 
have been busy diversifying their portfolios overseas. So uh, in, the, in the year 2000, in 1999, I beg your pardon, um, UK pension funds on average had over 50% of their allocation to UK equities. Today, it's nearer five. So you can see what's caused this long-term decline of, of the UK market compared to some other areas. However, that's all the bad news. And that's all the stuff that's already happened that's in the past. That's the kind of stuff which is in the press and therefore in the price. Right now, today, I, and I am an international investor to my core, think the UK is as cheap as it's been against major markets throughout my lifetime. Uh, and I'm not as young as I look. Um, it's certainly the cheapest it's been since 1974 against the United States market. As I said, some of those big companies have become a little bit pricey. Uh, on a more prosaic, uh, and it sounds technical, but I'll, I'll try and explain it uh, level, there are more companies in the mid and small cap sectors, and this is about 20% of the UK market, but best reflects the UK PLC, if I can put it that way. There are more companies in that area which have something called a free cash flow yield of more than 10%. Let me explain what that means. If you've got a free cash flow yield of 10%, that means over 10 years, you will recover through free cash flow the entire value of your company. This is an extraordinarily large number of companies to have uh, this very high free cash flow yield. It means that uh, investors aren't valuing those cash flows in a rational way. So having been underweight the UK for many, many years, over the recent past, we have progressively increased our weightings in the UK. And now we're more or less neutral. In fact, dare I say, very small smidge overweight because the value is just so good. So ultimately, value will out. I'm convinced of that. And the UK will have its day. Well, uh, that's not that sometime soon. Uh, let's hope it's soon. Um, uh, uh, it's probably my turn to ask a couple of questions of you. Uh, um, so um, let's talk about fixed interest. We sort of tease people by mentioning fixed interest. Uh, and we've talked for quite a while, or let's say quite a while, for a year or so, uh, about some of the opportunities we see in fixed interest. Uh, and a year ago, that was very much a contrarian uh, position to have. H how do you feel today? Because the times have moved on and, and uh, markets have moved. Um, how do you see that the situation in fixed interest going forward from here? Well, I, I think it's progressing along the tracks that we expected it to. Um, uh, maybe take a little bit more time, um, but I don't think that's deflected away from the opportunity set ahead. And there's been lots of questions that come in on fixed interest, and please feel free to send send more across. And we can we can get into the the weeds of specific fixed interest investments on on the questions as well afterwards. But in very simple terms, what people are saying is, well, has the outlook for interest rates and inflation? changed our view in, in any way on um, the positive view that we've been peddling in fixed interest. In very simple terms, no, it hasn't. And in some cases, it's actually strengthened the view that we had. Now, as you rightly point out, a year ago, this was a very contrarian view. And when we talked about it on some of the early um, iterations that you and I did of these calls and webinars, uh, we said that the future was likely to look like the past, i.e. the red bar that we saw in 2022, which was truly one for the ages, was likely to be followed by a green bar um, as fixed interest, which is effectively a mathematical asset class. You don't have to have hope and belief like you do in equity markets. It's a simple mathematical equation. The likelihood was going forwards that mathematics would mean that you made a positive return. And that has been the case as we show on this next chart here. But there is still very much more to go. We've just seen, in a sense, a a bit of a sort of moving away from the precipice uh, or from the abyss that we saw after the Liz Trust incident in the UK market last year. We think there's much more still to go, but let's keep it simple for now and get more into the details and questions if, if we need to. But what might we expect from fixed interest markets going forward? Now, in very simple terms, where we are today in the form of the income available from fixed interest markets, by comparison to history, is exactly where we were when I first started investing 
and some of you were clients of ours then, 20 years ago. And the rates of return that we expect going forwards are similar to that which we saw from 2002 onwards. Now, this isn't a promise, but it is, again, based upon the mathematical situations that we currently see in fixed interest markets. And we would expect a return from our fixed interest investments of roughly 5% per annum going forwards. And everyone should just think about how different a setup that is for private client portfolios. Because in the last decade, the available return from fixed interest, because of the actions of central banks keeping interest rates at zero, and because of the manipulation of bond markets by governments, i.e. quantitative easing and the printing of lots of money and buying bonds, meant that the fixed interest returns that you received in the last decade were paltry, in any sense of the word, particularly by comparison to the long run of history. We would argue that we're going back to what we saw at the start of my investment career. And going forwards, if your fixed interest portfolio or part portfolio can generate sort of 5% returns per annum, it gives you a much better setup for the overall portfolio achieving your long-term aims and aspirations. And that's what we think will happen going forwards. And none of this is down to hope and belief. It's a pure statement of the income yields on offer and how long you should be holding those fixed interest markets for into the future. We might be wrong in the short run, but I think in the long run, these are the sorts of numbers that make sense. So delighted to take more questions on that in a minute. But I, I think in, in order just to sort of bring it to a, um, uh, you know, a conclusion of what we've been saying and, and, and really tackle those questions head on, I think the... The way to view the cash situation is, is that currently cash is attractive. It should be forming a bigger part of your asset allocation mix. But we see it as being a, a complement to rather than a replacement for wealth management. And we don't expect these sorts of interest rates to be around forever. I think from the well, very simply, the UK government can't afford to interest rates to be at these levels forever. So, so our expectation is that they will come lower. And that will have an impact upon your reinvestment situations from fixed term deposits and asset markets more generally. I think for this year, the tail of the tape has been that A, worst case outcomes have been avoided. The environment's actually been better than most people were forecasting. And also we are in a situation where despite all the volatility and the risks that are out there, asset valuations are much more attractive than they've been for quite a long time. In very simple terms, we head to questions. We are confident as opposed to complacent about the outlook for our clients' investment strategies. And I think we're genuinely excited about the investment opportunities that we can currently find. So now to elaborate on that further, I think we should start tackling the questions, Richard. So over to you. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, let's um, start with one which has been very popular. Um, uh, and it's about politics, uh, a subject which I know that you like to opine um, on quite a bit. Um, so um, uh, obviously, US elections next year, UK elections maybe next year, maybe a little bit after, but have to be a little bit after, uh, maybe even some other elections around. Tom, what, what's your view uh, well, on, on what that means? Yeah, I said in the introduction that we got on very well, despite being separate rooms. I'm not sure that's going to be the case after this. I should have been in charge of apportioning the questions. Um, well, we, we can't ignore the political backdrop at this point in time. That, that That's pretty obvious. I, I think... Again, we need to leave our political views to one side. I've become increasingly um, apolitical, in all honesty, perhaps because it's the range of options that we have uh, to choose from in the developed worlds over the choice of leaders that we have at this point in time, which I'm sure that we can probably all agree with. Um, and we have to think about what the market implications might be. Let's assume for a second that the betting markets have it right. Uh, and they might have it wrong, but let's assume they got it right. And um, the next government in the UK is going to be a Labour-led administration. And I think despite the good job that Rishi Sunak is doing, um, and I think he's doing a commendable job given the difficult circumstances, uh, I think that does seem like the most likely outcome. And perhaps recent events in Scotland point towards the Labour Party winning more seats there than was previously expected. So what might an incoming Labour administration next year mean for markets? I think it's going to mean a lot more of the status quo ante. And the reason behind that is that the willingness of bond markets and our international creditors, those strangers who we rely upon to finance our government's deficit, will not take anything extreme. And we learned that during the Liz Trust incident of late last year. So my assumption is that despite a change in government that seems likely, as suggested by most people, and there won't be a huge change in, 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 in political direction, which impacts upon financial markets. In the US, uh, despite the fact that people would paint extreme views on, on the US election, I think something similar. We must remember 
that whilst Trump was an odious character on, on many levels, actually a lot of his policies went down pretty well in the economic situation. He was very popular with business at the same time. Uh, I'm not sure that we can say the same about the Biden administration, despite the fact that, and they said they were going to go against a lot of Trump's policies, They've actually continued a lot of them forward, including on foreign policy, uh, not least. And, and so our assumption is whoever wins the US election, we probably see more of the same there as well. My base case is there are elections to lose. The current situations on a fiscal side in both the US and the UK are problematic, but it sets up for a year of excitement in the political sphere next year, even if the long run effects are not particularly um, politically extreme. But we also must note that there's things like the Taiwanese election next year and various things like that. So I think to carry on with that turbulent 20s metaphor that we have done will be appropriate next year. But again, I think politics can cause volatility, but let's use that to our advantage as a friend, not an enemy, and use it to shape positive investment decisions going forward. Yeah, it's an interesting one. And look, we've had another question, which I'll, I'll handle um, to give you a, a pause for breath, Tom, uh, mm-hmm. on uh, inflation, UK inflation. Um, and you know, a lot of people focus on uh, the headline level because that's what the press focus on, which is currently around 6%. And that's the one that's been coming down quite nicely. Um, that headline level, that includes uh, everything. So in, that includes food and energy, um, uh, which are clearly very important components, particularly for uh, people who are on the poorer end of the spectrum, where food in particular is a large component of their uh, monthly expenditure. And and to put that in perspective, food inflation on its own peaked out at just over 17%, 17%, not that many months ago, and is still quite high, but coming down. The key point here is that core inflation has been stickier because uh, it excludes those more volatile elements. So not only did it not go up as much, but it hasn't come down as much either. But for the first time recently, we've begun to see indications that finally core indication uh, inflation uh, is also beginning to come down. And that's very, very encouraging because ultimately a good central bank will look at both types to try and pitch its policy stance And the fact that core is coming down should help the Bank of England uh, take their foot off the brakes. And also bear in mind on inflation that in October 2022, there was an especially large print for inflation in the UK, 2% on its own. Uh, And obviously, if the October number where we're living through at the moment doesn't come anywhere near that, which we don't expect it to, there'll be a mathematically certain significant drop in the UK headline rate. Again, apologies to talk about the headline rate, um, which of course will allow Rishi Sunak and the government to declare victory in its determination uh, to drive inflation down by half since the beginning of the year. Not that nowhere else in the world isn't all also doing the same thing. I'm actually going to steal one of the questions uh, and leave one of the more difficult ones to you. There, there are some questions we probably won't get to today, but we promise to answer them um, afterwards with, um, with with direct emails. And, and if we haven't got your details, then let us know and we'll come back to you uh, with, with, with answers. But one of the questions goes back to something I said originally about the opportunities in, in cash versus wealth management portfolios uh, and refers back to that table mountain profile of interest rates being held at a plateau in restricted territory for some time to come. Uh, and my view was, and our view is that that's unlikely. If they do manage to keep interest rates at the current levels for a long time in the future, that would speak to an economic environment which remains very positive, which ultimately would be a good thing and means that we could probably make more money from private client portfolios than we're currently forecasting. So I'm not averse to the table mountain profile. I just think it's unlikely for a couple of reasons. First of all, we expect um, interest rates to be um, uh, moving lower towards the end of next year at the latest because of a weakening economic situation. If things are good enough to keep interest rates high, then that's great. Uh, We suspect that they probably won't be. The other major reason that the question um, points out um, just refers to government balance sheets. And we've got a situation right now where interest rates have gone up and central banks are selling their bonds they bought through quantitative easing through things like the COVID experience. And that's adding to a groundswell of negativity in bond markets, which is pushing yields up. And as the question rightly points out, That's a very difficult situation for governments to be because it means that refinancing their debts and issuing new debts in the future is going to be more expensive. And this is an absolute reason why I think that interest rate projection of a table mountain for a long time in the future 
will fall foul of the reality of the economic situation and the reality of what governments need to do with regards to their balance sheets. The governments of the UK and the US, which are still spending far more money than they're bringing in, cannot afford interest rates above 5% for very long. That's absolutely our view. And that will mean that interest rates probably have to start coming down. And that change in tone could happen at the middle point of next year. Governments will be fast running out of money if interest rates, and it's our money, don't forget, not their money, uh, will be fast running out of money if interest rates are maintained at these levels for very long in the future. That is why we are sceptical over that specific subject. Thanks, Tom. I'm going to pick up a question which alludes to ESG and particular, uh, particularly carbon tar uh, targets. The question is basically asking whether all uh, the Western world uh, countries' pledges to achieve net zero uh, will um, affect the, the major polluters, their major polluters, to switch to renewable energy. Well, first off, let me just say it's not just um, the major polluters who are impacted by the legislation which underpins those commitments. So the Theresa May government, I think it was in 2018, uh, committed the UK to net zero by 2050 and put that into a legislative uh, uh, package, which all companies across the UK are now struggling, getting their heads around, working out how they're going to do. And Canaccord Genuity ourselves are doing this. Uh, and for my uh, pleasure rather than sins, I sit on our Climate Action and Sustainability uh, Committee where we look at these things. So it's not just the polluters. The key point really is that the polluters, let's use energy companies, oil companies as an example of that, absolutely are making enormous strides to reduce their, uh, their carbon footprint and indeed to meet uh, the commitments that their governments have made, if necessary, of course, by buying carbon credits, but let's leave that to one side. Um, so in, in a sense, uh, it, the, the, the question is not so much whether they will, but whether they will on time. And more recently, as we know, the political environment has shifted to a little bit more scepticism around the timescale. We had the announcement about uh, internal combustion engine cars, for example, uh, being the, the, the deadline for phasing them out being extended uh, and so forth. So uh, I, I, I do think we are going to get there. It is an enormous effort being made across the entire economy and, and not just in the UK, obviously. Uh, but, you know, energy companies um, are being driven by legislation to do that. Yes. I think it's probably time for one, one final question. I'm going to try and um, accumulate many of the questions into one. And, and, and that's around relative value opportunities in markets and trying to think about sensible timeframes. And, and, and this is definitely a subject that Richard and I get when we go all around the country to our various offices and see lots of our clients. And, and, and I think... Investment is a complicated subject, and people try and make it seem even more complicated um, than it necessarily needs to be. And I think in trying to frame sensible medium to long term expectations, I, I think we just need to sort of think about what the long run of history has said and what we expect can be sensible going forwards. And Richard and I have both been investing now for 20 years and slightly longer than 20 years. Uh, and we can talk about what's been the experience through our respective respective careers. But we'll talk about history in a minute. First of all, what, what might we expect in the future? Well, we know if we look at our fixed interest allocations, we know that the combined yield on offer is a little in excess of 6%. That's a very simple number. If we adjust it for fees, a little bit conservative, it might well be that we end up with a number that's roughly around 5% expected return from fixed interest. Again, let's ignore history for a second and just think about the future. Um, the expected long run rate of return of equities is roughly eight or nine percent. I think over the long run, Richard, that, 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 that's about what's been what's been what's been painted. Um, let's be conservative once again, and let, let's adjust that for the turbulence that we're seeing in this decade, and, and, and bring it on to a more conservative number, and say that equities might also deliver around six percent. And again, adjust that for fees, and you might end up with a number around five percent. So on a headline basis, you could look at it and say that the overall combined expected portfolio return on a medium to long term basis should be around five percent. Now let's bring history into it. On the last 20 years of managing a portfolio of a sort of a balanced sort of risk, those rates of return have been observed through the past. So what we're simply saying is that, yes, it might look very complicated and difficult as we go forwards, 
But in terms of setting medium to long term expectations, we think it will actually look quite similar to the past, what we might achieve in the future. But a lot of the questions point towards that not one size fits all for all clients and there must be different opportunities elsewhere. And that's absolutely where things start to get more interesting. In the last decade, the best investment strategy anyone could have had was find the cheapest provider and just go out and buy the cheapest route of implementation for investments and just buy an index. Our suspicion is, and we're seeing this already, is the excitement comes from lots of different investments operating on different wavelengths and a great deal more bifurcation between idiosyncratic investment opportunities that we should hopefully be able to find different ways to achieve in excess of that 5% in equities or a bit more in fixed interest. And that's why, despite all the turbulence we've talked about today, Richard and I are genuinely optimistic about the future and confident, and confidence is different to complacency about achieving your long-term aims and aspirations. We appreciate the last couple of years for financial markets have been pretty miserable and pretty volatile. Uh, but I think that based on what we said today, um, perhaps there is still a future for wealth management. We're not headed for extinction anytime soon, Richard, but maybe not. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Tom. I, I certainly hope not. I need a few more years before I become extinct. Thank you. Um, and uh, uh, with that, we'll conclude. Thank you ever so much, everyone, for taking 45 minutes of your valuable time to listen to Tom and I drone on. Um, all the questions that you've submitted, we will get back to you if you have left a name um, so that we can uh, answer your specific points. And should you wish, uh, I'm aware that a recording of this uh, webinar will be available. Uh, so please ask your normal contact for that recording should you require it. So uh, without further ado, I just wish you all a very good afternoon. And since we won't be speaking uh, until after Christmas, I imagine, uh, a very uh, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.